It's interesting, yeah, and uh, this is what we have, and we're going to discuss. We're going to discuss the views of certain rabbis concerning the Messiah's pet son of Joseph. So we, these are sources that uh, Rabbi David found for us, and we had uh, also been acquainted with some of them, but we did not know that they said these things, or they said precisely the things we have here now found, but we knew that they were thinking in that direct direction. So we have a uh, Safata Met, we have a Safata Met, and uh, Safata Met is also, its name is also sometimes pronounced as Spasimus. It's a commentary written by Rabbi Huda Arya Leib Alta in 1847-1905, who's a rabbi, that is the chief rabbi, like the Lubavitch rabbi, the rabbi who sent me a famous Hasidic rabbis, they're known as rabbis. And uh, he was one of them. He was one of the, for a while, he was one of them, and he was one of the largest group in history uh, before the before the Holocaust. There's a good Hasidim in Poland, so he's an important person. Uh, in his own right, and he is, talks about the lost in times, and he says he and uh, he says uh, he talks about the lost in times. He says that the issue of Judah and Joseph comprises a general rule applicable to all the tribes. In other words, uh, what we learn about the lost in times, what we learn about the Judah and Joseph applies to all of the tribes. So Joseph is the head of the tribe. Joseph emerges from the other tribes. He is both above them and part of them. And Joseph had an extra blessing. If you look at the Torah in Genesis 48, it says, before when Jacob had the tribe, we had the sons of Jacob, 12 tribes of, of, of Israel descend from Jacob. Jacob was also known as Israel. Before he died, Jacob blessed the tribes. But before he blessed the tribes, he called Joseph and his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, and Manasseh into him, and he gave them a separate blessing, he gave them their own blessing. Then later on, he gave them, he gave them the tribes another blessing. So the blessing he gave to uh, to the to them separately when they came in, the Genesis 48, verse 15 onward, Jacob blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life about along to this day. Then you let him redeem me from all evil. Bless the lads with my hand name be named upon them. And then when my fathers Abraham and Isaac let them grow into mother to the midst of the earth. And then, and then after that, he calls all of the tribes together, all the other sons together, and he gives them a blessing, each one a separate blessing, and he blesses Joseph again. Genesis 49, he says, Joseph is a fruitful bell, a fruitful bell by a well. Actually, by a well, by a eye, it says, by the eye, uh, by the eye, his branches run over the world, by the eye above. So this is, uh, you see on the dollar bill, and look at the dollar bill, you see an eye, you see a pyramid, it was a symbol of Joseph, according to the Midrash, a pyramid, the dollar bill, and the great seal of America, and above the pyramid, the pyramid is an eye, an all-seeing eye, and this is referred to in the blessing to Joseph, in Genesis 49, in the Hebrew. See our commentaries on this. His branches run over the world, the archers have bitterly cleaved him, shot at him, and hated him, but his bow remained in strength. The arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel, by the God of your Father who will help you, and by the Almighty who will bless you, with a blessing to heaven above, blessing to the deep that lies beneath, blessing to the breast of the womb, blessings of your Father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors up to the utmost, blessing bound of the everlasting hills, they could be on the head of Joseph, and the crown of the head of separate from his brothers. And this is what the Apostle Matthew is referring to, and he says that Joseph is a separate blessing, but it's a separate blessing and a blessing amongst the tribes because he's above, above them, a part of them. And he says that each and every one of us, each and every one of us, each and every Israelite has within him aspects of both Judah and Joseph within their, within themselves. And so too when the Messiah, son of Joseph, the Messiah, son of David, come, they will be able to revoke his aspects of themselves that they have within us, and then we will therefore we will be able to relate to them. And then another authority we have is some unknown famous person named the same Mishmur. Same Mishmur. That is the name of the book or the commentary. Uh, five volumes actually, and the uh, thick volumes, uh, bulky volumes, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of material. Anyway. And it's saying, Mishmur is the name of a commentary on the Torah by Rabbi Shmuel Bornstein. 
1856, he was the second rabbi. He was also a rabbi. And he was the second rabbi of his dynasty. They have dynasty, his father, the son, and so on. For the Islam is the head of the Hazardim, and he also had a large following. He was important. He was related to the Salah Samet, who he spoke, who he quoted. He was a living, I think, in the early 1900s. And he had thousands of Hazardim following him in, in certain and public cities of Sokotov and Lodz. So he says he wrote a lot on the Lost and Tribes, uh, or not, he wrote a lot on. Not only so much on the Western tribes, but he wrote on the Messiah son of Joseph and the symbolic significance of Joseph. And he says the Messiah son of Joseph would defeat Edom in war, like they all say that. It's actually in the Talmud, it's in the Bible. The book of Abijah says that. So subsequently, or parallel to that, a portion of Edom will repent. He says uh, in the end, not all of the Edom will be destroyed, a portion of them will repent and attach themselves to Israel. And this seems to be connected to the Messiah, son of Joseph, so a portion of Edom will repent on him, comes up to be defeated by him, and they will become part of according to this. And the other sources, other sources confirm this. On our website, we have other articles from other people who seem to confirm something along these lines. At any, at all events, it's what the Shmuel ben uh, Shmuel. Shane Mishmu says, he also says that the, uh, the Saiban, son of Joseph, overcomes sexual impurity, impurities. Sexual trouble, problems, he, he goes, he contemplates on this matter, and so do some of the other authorities also do. They associate the Saiban, son of Joseph, with the ability to overcome sexual temptation. Like Joseph, Joseph was, was uh, tempted, the wife of, of, uh, of Potipharah, his master, tried to seduce him, almost raped him, stripped him of his garment, and he fled from her. He overcame his sexual temptation at the risk of his life, and indeed he was in prison from it because of it. So the Messiah, the son of Joseph, also has this ability to overcome sexual lust and to, to also to repair things, to repair things that have done. Every one people have sinned in sexual ways so or have done uh, uh, masturbated or done whatever they have done things they shouldn't have done. And the Messiah, son of Joseph, is able to overcome this uh, to rectify what has been done. And he also points out that doing these things disturbs the clarity of thought. People who do these things have difficulty in thinking, it causes them all kinds of problems. Uh, and he goes on uh, at some length on this matter. He also says that uh, most of the non Israelite Gentiles will willingly submit after being defeated by Messiah, son of Joseph. And they will serve him. They will serve Yisrael because of him. They will relate to him. After he's been, been in, he, they will relate to him. It says in Isaiah 61, For strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. The sons of the foreigner shall be your plowmen and your wine dressers. They will be pleased to serve you as well. It mentions the ten horned beasts of Daniel, the book of Daniel, is he dog, who will fight against the Messiah and the end times. He also says that Jonathan, you know the story of Jonathan and David, Jonathan was the son of Saul, the friend of David, he helped save David's life. And he said, he said to David, when his father, the Saul, was trying to kill David, and uh, Jonathan was helping him escape of saving him. And he said, he says, but, uh, you shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. So he wasn't, he was killed before them, but he's speaking about the future, the future. In the future, the Messiah, son of Joseph, will be a, a reincarnation or re embodiment or a, a descendant of Jonathan, and he too will be the second in command under the Messiah, son of David. And this prophecy of Jonathan said, then will come into effect. And now we have another authority, Rabbi Sadak al Kohen. Rabbi Sadak al Kohen, uh, from uh, the Rabbi Sadak Lubin, he's also known as, from Lubin, Lubin was the city of Poland, he's also known as Rabbi Sadak al Kohen. Rabinovitz, 1823-1900, he was a significant Jewish thinker and leader. He was also a big leader. And he was a writer, prolific writer in all areas of Judaism, Hanukkah law, has to do with the Kabbalah, ethics. He wrote scholarly essays, not only that, he wrote on astronomy, geometry, geometry, algebra. He knew a lot of things and he wrote. He wrote on these things. And uh, one of his famous uh, principles is that you do not destroy the evil inclination, you do not squelch it, but you redirect it. 
We channel its energies positively. And you also mentioned that concerning the oral law, the oral law is the oral tradition that the Jews abide by. And he said that, that this came about through the uh, members of the Great Assembly and the successors, as we mentioned before. Uh, and uh, shortly after they had come back to the land of Israel, the uh, Alexander the Great took over. And in the sense of Alexander the Great, the, the uh, so look at monarchs. Uh, also, we kind of controlled the area of Judah and its surroundings, and I tried to Hellenize to make uh, all those other subjects follow Greek culture and worship Greek gods and so on. And uh, they persecuted religious Jews, and there was a war against them. And the Maccabees, the Maccabees, the Book of Maccabees, you all know it, heard the story. Another you know, feast of Hanukkah is celebrated of victory over these um, these, these uh, Greeks, these Greek. Hellenizers, because there wasn't so much Greek, but at that time, the kind of just uh, Gentile, Gentile pagans who had adopted and uh, were advocating promoting Greek culture, what was considered Greek culture, and they fought. They fought against the Maccabees, and they won on the, a major war power at that time. At that time, there was Rome, who was uh, the Seleucid, Seleucid uh, Hellenizers in northern Syria, and also there was a uh, the Ptolemies in Egypt, and to the east there were the Parthians who ruled over Persia. And they were the major world powers at that time. There was also Carthage for a while, Northern Africa. So there's, this, is a, this is a major power, and they put the, the Asmonians over, overtook them, beat them. And when uh, Rabbi Zedek said when they defeated them, they also took over good things that they had, some attributes was the things that they had, they adopted them to themselves. And he quite says, God will give the beauty of Japheth and his, and, uh, and this will dwell in the tents of Shem, see Genesis 9, 27, concerning the sons of Noah. Japheth was the forefather of, the, of, of Yavan, who gave rise to the Greek people. And he says, after they conquered them, defeated them, the Jews could... Uh, integrate natural science, logic, philosophy, into the word of the written law. And only then could the oral law, the oral tradition, begin to flourish. Because as we said, the prophecy had ceased and the intellectual powers and logic and tools of thought that the Greeks had. And after they, the, the Jews defeated them, they were able to take them over and take control of them and uh, adapt them to their own, to the usages of uh, worshipping your logic. And he also mentions the principle that the first time someone or something is mentioned in the Bible, the first mention encapsulates its essential nature of that thing you mentioned. And he spoke often of the lost in tribes and the Messiah, son of Joseph, who read them in the end times. And he also mentions the Messiah, son of David, who will be from the tribe of Judah. He will put the Jews to repent, keep the Torah, the big enemies of Israel, complete the unification of the ten tribes. Messiah, son of Joseph, will initiate it, begin it. Messiah, son of David, will complete it in the, in the union between Judah and those ten tribes. And they will also initiate a process enabling every Israelite to know to what tribe they belong to and fulfill the prophecies concerning the end times. End times. The son of Joseph would subdue all peoples of the earth. The war of Gog and Magog is involved with this. So what exactly happens, we don't know, because uh, the prophecies concerning this war in this time are uh, not certain, and the interpretation is uh, uh, there's no unanimity between what they mean and what happened, but uh, this will be something that we will encounter. He says that the Messiah, son of Joseph, is the soul of the church of the patriarch. He says that um, the Messiah, son of Joseph, sent from Joshua, the son of Nun, who succeeded Moses, and the story of Moses, except for the five books of the Bible, you know, the story of the book of Joshua, just comes out, Joshua completed the, the success of Moses, completed the conquest of the land, and then divided the land up amongst all the tribes. So the, the, the Messiah, son of Joseph, is a descendant of his, and will complete that which he did then. He also mentioned that the Messiah, son of Joseph, derives his power from Joseph, his ancestor. Just as Joseph ruled over the Gentiles, he was the king of the ruler of Egypt and had 
it's connected with the non Jewish. This was before the giving of the Torah. So he says that all the power of Joseph, the principle of Joseph, emanates from Joseph as he was then before the giving of the Torah. And therefore he can relate more easily with the Gentiles. They resonate with him. They enter, they uh, identify with him. They accept him easier than they would others. But at the same time, there's a problem that they have get too familiar with him. They affect him. And therefore, he needs an input from Judah in order to be able to keep a distance from them. And he also says the Messiah son of Joseph will defeat the Gentiles, so they must follow after him. The Messiah son of Joseph goes to war with his horns, the horn in the Rhyme Unicorn, and he busts the Gentiles until the ends of the earth. And uh, he mentions his mystical significance of this. He also mentions the tribe of Dan. This is important. The tribe of Dan will go together with the Messiah, son of Joseph. From the tribe of Dan will come someone who will help the Messiah, son of Joseph, will help him be his second in command. From Dan, the tribe of Dan will rule together with the Messiah, son of Joseph, the son of Dan. The tribe of Dan will participate in building the third temple, just as it was a part in the building of the tabernacle and the temple of Solomon. You know, the other tabernacle in the wilderness. Was built by Bethsaida, who designed it for all the arm from the tribe of Dan, assist was his assistant. So, to when Solomon built the temple, he had Kira, Kira from the from Tyre. He was actually from both Dan and Naphtali, but he's uh, identified with Dan. And here, Solomon built the temple. So, to in the future, from the tribe of Dan, we become those who assist the Messiah, son of Joseph, to build the temple. And he also says that Joseph, in his own way, is also somehow either connected with the oral tradition, his own input towards his own stuff, and give of it. And there are those who say that the Rabbi Akiva was the foremost rabbi in the Talmud. Rabbi Akiva was a, and a, was known as a, Akiva, son of Joseph. He says his father was a convert. There are those who say that Rabbi Akiva was connected with the Messiah, son of Joseph, in, in a way. So that's what the are going to count. So the last authority who will quote is Shem Shem, Shem, Shem Raphael Hirsch, Rabbi Shem Shem Raphael Hirsch, 1898. He was a German. He lived in Germany. He, had, he thought like a German. He spoke like a German. He wrote in German. And his style is somewhat difficult because of that, especially for modern people. But nevertheless, in his day, he was so important. And he was a, an Orthodox rabbi. He's known for his intellectual approach to the modern world. Actually, I had a, a rabbi, uh, Rabbi Rabbi Jacobson. He's actually a great rabbi, and he helped a lot of Jews. He helped me a lot, and he advised them, and he was also an intellectual. So I once, once said, when he's advising someone who is having problems with the Israeli bureaucracy, and he said, listen, I'm, uh, I was born in Germany. I think like a German. People uh, tell me I think like a German, and I can't help it. It's what I am. And this is what I have to cope with. And I realize that I'm in a living time country and I think differently. So you do have to adapt yourself. So that was interesting. Anyway, Rabbi Shimson Raphael Hirsch. He was a uh, rabbi in Oldenburg, in Germany. And afterwards, he was chief rabbi of Moravia. And he wrote a lot of books, uh, good books, interesting books, uh, come classics of Jewish thought. And he was opposed to Reform Judaism, opposed to Zionism. Uh, and he opposed to early forms of conservative Judaism. He was uh, orthodox, strictly orthodox, even though he was uh, always, uh, at the same time being an intellectual and open to streams of thought. He even claims that some of his works are uh, imitations of Hegel, uh, his, his vocabulary and his terminology. I wouldn't know about that, but it's worth noting. Anyway, he says that the Ten Tribes and, and uh, the Messiah, son of Joseph, they converge. They're aspects of the same phenomenon. They're the weapons of war of Israel. And he quotes, he quotes based on the verse, uh, Genesis 48, 19. His father Jacob refused and said, I know my son, I know he shall become a, a people. He also shall be great. Never list his younger brother Ephraim. Shall be greater than he, and his offspring shall fill the nations, rule over the nations according to the translation. Now the earth says, as the sense of Ephraim, the complement, the tribes of, of Israel. They shall be their weapons of war. Their weapons of war, you are my battle axe, says the prophet. The weapon with which I was crushed the nations, they, in the sense of their crime, that is the ten tribes, shall be the weapons of war towards outsiders. 
He's the same as what's happening with the in the internal affairs of the other tribes. The Dread Order of Rome should be on the other nations. There's a map. There's a map available on the internet and also on our website showing all the nations that Britain has invaded at some time or other. There are only about three nations in the world, such as uh, Lichtenberg and some other small place, Mongolia. Some other small place that Britain never invaded. All the others Britain invaded some time or other. And America too. And he goes on, the general order of Ephraim should be on the other nations. Ephraim might show the test for the power of the tribes, be their force of arms against foreigners. The kingdom of Ephraim was similar in its characteristics to a non-Jewish polity. And he quotes Genesis 49, the blessings of your father are stronger than the blessings of the eternal mountains. The boundaries of the everlasting hills, and they can be on the head of Joseph, on the brow of him who was set apart from his brothers. And he says, Judah and Joseph, the two central points in the blessing of Jacob. This will continue until the last generation, the later days. The house of Joseph and the house of Judah encompass all the Israel people. Everyone is either part of the house of Joseph or part of the house of Judah. We have a tradition that the last days it shall be an heir to the house of Joseph to prepare the ground for a chosen Sion, the successor from the house of Judah. In other words, he's referring to the Messiah son of Joseph will prepare the way for the Messiah son of David. The regulation is, is, is solid, he's stable, conservative. He, if he says something, it, he believes not only does he believe in it, but he, he is certain that no one will challenge the veracity of it. If he says it, it's authoritative. So this is what he says. And he goes on, he says that there's certainly reason for the emphasis of Jacob, the future hope and blessings would converge on Joseph, no less than on Judah, that are both important. So that is what we have. That is what we have. That is what we have.